are you guys doing? Thank you again for joining me. Uh, as always, I had a little bit of trouble uh, turning it on, but now we're all here. Um, so today we'll be talking about oolong. Um, now, every time people uh, say their favorite tea is oolong, I always uh, then have to ask, what oolong? Because oolong might just uh, will be the most uh, dynamic category of teas. You literally have some of the lightest teas that are oolong, and then you also have some of the boldest and the darkest teas that are oolong as well. Um, so it's a, it's a category of tea that really can satisfy a very wide range of taste preference. Um, but in general, you can divide the oolong into uh, three big categories. Uh, just keep in mind, uh, they all have different academic names. So it'll be Ninbei oolong, Minnan oolong, and Chaozhou oolong. However, these, if these terms sound unfamiliar uh, to you, don't uh, worry, because we usually remember them by uh, the kind of tea that's the most representative for each of the category. So correspondingly, for Minbei oolong, we have uh, Wei Yan Cha. Uh, which can be translated to cliff tea, rock tea, you get the idea. And then you have Minnan Oolong, uh, the most representative would be Tie Guan Yin. And then uh, you have uh, Chaozhou Oolong, which actually used to be called Rao Kung Oolong because that's actually where uh, uh, the jurisdiction, the tea mountain used to belong to, but now it's in uh, the city of Chaozhou, so we call it Chaozhou Oolong. And that is Dan Tong. Uh, now that song is even a misnomer, um, so it really should be uh, Phoenix Oolong. Anyway, so uh, now you have these three different categories, and I am going to first brew a Tie Guan Yin. Um, and also just as usual, um, because I have trouble seeing the questions while I'm brewing the tea and doing this, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to hold off the question till the end, but do make sure you ask the questions at the end. Uh, I think there's a function where you can actually type your question. I'll be checking that as well. Um, I hope with today's setup, you can see the tea a little bit better. So I want to first show you uh, a Tie Guan Yin. Now, uh, Tie Guan Yin, the uh, true origin, so uh, as with all teas, you know, the most important thing is the location or the towar. So you have location and you have varietal, which is a very, very big thing for oolong because oolong most likely are processed with single cultivar. And then um, you have the uh, processing, which also matters immensely for uh, making a uh, good, mediocre, or really bad oolong. Now, but everything starts with the location though, and the other two kind of just like fall in place with the location. So um, for uh, Tie Guan Yin, uh, which sometimes translates to Iron Goddess of Buddha, uh, which is a very weird translation because um, uh, Guan Yin is a Buddha Saba and uh, um, it usually takes a male form, but really it's supposed to be genderless. But anyway, so uh, this is a, a, a tea that within this tea, you can have so many different categories because this was the most popular tea uh, in the 90s uh, in China. And the uh, development of this tea was just amazing. So uh, just give you an overview without going into detail, you basically have the uh, traditional Tie Guan Yin and you have the new style Tie Guan Yin. And the new style Tie Guan Yin, you can have it roasted or you can have it unroasted. And the unroasted, you have five different kinds, depends on when you have decided to uh, demonstrate the kill green step of the tea. So that's the, uh, the difference in the different categories. Um, this is a new style, unroasted, one of the main, uh, five uh, styles of Tie Guan Yin called Zheng Chao. Um, so as you can see, uh, this tea is, uh, has uh, what we call a half ball shape, and it, all the stamps need to be picked out. Um, it's a very pleasant tea. Uh, this tea was uh, first developed to uh, really cater to the green tea consumers, so uh, that's why it's so green, and uh, it's, it's developed in the modern time, of course, and so uh, it was very uh, popular in Japan and also in northern China, where people are used to uh, having green tea instead of oolong. Uh, by the way, this shape, uh, in China, we call it the uh, the toad head and then the uh, dragonfly tail. 
Um, but the reason it's called Tianguan is because apparently a long time ago, you know, we have this emperor. By the way, this emperor is actually contemporary with George Washington. So uh, just give you give you a, a little uh, perspective on the history. Um, the emperor uh, Tianlong rumored is be uh, associated with this tea. And uh, when he looked at this tea, he said, wow, it's uh, as heavy as iron and has the appearance of Guanyin the Buddha Sava, hence the name Tie Guanyin, Iron Buddha Sava Guanyin. So this tea is very tightly rolled, and you'll be able to see that this tea opens up immensely after we brew it. So then remember this style of oolong was first actually developed for, uh, so this style of brewing was first developed for oolong. Um, so you want to use the standard brewing size, which is 8 grams. And um, for best practice, we're not going to drink the tea, we're waking up the leaves. And we're giving it to our lovely tea pet, Juju. Um, and if you're brewing the tea for the guests, once we all get out of this quarantine mode, um, you want to offer the guests to smell the cup. Now, this is a tea that has a um, very distinctive fresh flower kind of nose. So it's like almost a combination of grassiness and a floral. Um, you, you saw how light the color is. Now, this is very important. Um, when in doubt, when everything else equals, if it's the same style of tea, especially if it's a light color tea, uh, here's a trick to tell the quality. You should always place your bet on the lightest color tea. So in Chinese, we say the whiter it is, the better. Especially for unroasted tea wine, we're actually looking for the water color. So basically colorless color. So sometimes if you have a tea wine that's very, very green, um, that's usually uh, it's a sign that was not fermented very well. Yeah, I also hope today with the white background, you can see everything a little bit more clearly. Right. And I hope everybody enjoyed the pour session that we had before. Oh, here's the tea. Now, this tea is one of those teas that has very, very low astringency level. It's almost uh, uh, not bitter at all. It does taste very fresh, um, it's sweet, um, but it's not like a sweet sweet, it's almost like a, when you have, um, it really is like when morning dew glides through uh, grass and you collect it with a flower petal and then drink it, that's kind of what the tea tastes like. Um, so some people might not like this very fresh taste, so that's why uh, there's a strong preference. And keep in mind, even though you know oolong is so dynamic, it has some of the lightest teas of the oolong and some of the darkest teas of the oolong. However, uh, oolongs are very, very showy. Uh, I would say even if it's a light oolong like this, it's like a very bubbly girl. It's like, look at me, look at me. Or it's like, look at me. Uh, it's always very demanding. It's very forward. So people are going to have very strong uh, likes and dislikes about oolong. It's less subtle than some of the other teas. Mm. This tea also has a very, very long aftertaste. So in China, there's a word that we just use to describe uh, the pleasant long afterward. It's actually a word we borrow from music. And this word is called yun. Um, depends on the different style of tea that you drink, people. Oh, sorry, poor connection. Uh, so it depends on the different style of tea that you're drinking, people are going to use uh, different adjectives to describe the yun. So for tea guanyin, people just describe it as the guanyin yun. So yun, um, in music, Chinese, we define it as the music you hear after the music has stopped. Yin zhi you yu, chen zhi wei yun. Um, so for uh, uh, taste, we kind of expand the same definition to it. So it's the taste that you taste after the taste has ended. So after you drink the tea, what are you actually feeling? And that's the yun. 
Um, now, for anything that we taste, you always want to divide it up into the quantity and the quality. Sometimes we uh, either overemphasize on one uh, or the other, but not both. What I mean is, so sometimes people will be like, oh, I like this taste. But how much is this taste that you like is actually being delivered? Or sometimes the tea will have a flaw. We always say there's no perfect tea. Um, and then how much of the taste that you dislike is there as well. And sometimes a tea is merely drinkable, it's only because it's so diluted. So it actually lose on both the quantity and the quality side, and that's how a tea is more drinkable. Uh, and then for the better tea, you are always going to have more quantity of things because the uh, location of the tea, the varietal, these kind of things give the tea potential to have more of the quantity of the taste. And it's up to the tea maker to well distribute this taste to give you the good quality distribution of these quantity factors. All right. Um, so this one has a very nice, like, kind of just like a, ch uh, like almost like a chiming kind of feeling to it. Um, and I also want to show you how much the tea leaves have opened up. So uh, you saw earlier how it occupied a very small uh, amount, but now, I mean, this is just a first brew, so the tea hasn't really fully opened up yet. Um, give it a little time, it'll actually open up even more. Um, you kind of want this kind of whitish color to it. It actually shows that the tea, uh, during the water traveling step of the tea making, it was done very thoroughly. Uh, because to bring a focus to this setup, I had to now move this out of sight to bring in another set for our next tea. So, uh, and I'm going to have one more of the tea going before I say goodbye to it. Uh, and of course, I'll finish it all after this. Um, I also want to make an announcement really quick. So, uh, to facilitate a more kind of formal uh, learning and but also still very casual um, and uh, we did a little poll earlier to ask people if you want to uh, know more about tasting or do you want to know more about uh, uh, brewing and it looks like it's like half and half they do kind of go hand in hand uh, and if you don't know how to brew tea properly it'll interfere with how you can properly taste the tea as well um, because tea brewing is really extension of the vision of the tea maker so if you cannot fully realize the maker's vision it doesn't do the tea justice so we decided to roll out this crash course um and it's on our website now i think it's just on the home page now so basically we're going to send you a, a kit and you can decide if you want to participate for both the brewing and the tasting or you want to participate for just the tasting and keep in mind that this is uh, like the, the material we put out is basically complementary to this. We just want to kind of time it really well so uh, we facilitate this community learning experience. So uh, there's no price increase for uh, our regular brewing set or from the sampler set. It's the same thing, but now we want to curate it and add educational material onto it so now you can uh, take this learning experience at home. And also we want to kind of do this together for eight or nine days, depends on if you want to brewing or not. And then so we can can, you know all be on the same page as well uh, this also helps to understand you know other more in-depth material that we'll put out later uh, so over here I have a dance home which is the second oolong that we want to try um, so Tiguanyin the, um, the new style unroasted Zheng Chao style Tiguanyin is a uh, oolong that is low fermentation and low uh, roasting so no roasting at all actually now this <laughs> is a dance hong. So dance hong is a style of oolong that is um, uh, mediumly ferment, uh, sorry, heavily fermented and mediumly roasted. So you're gonna immediately notice a difference in color. But what really does with the fermentation level is that the tea is gonna be significantly more fruity. And this is actually what we call just riper. Uh, that we we will say it's hot with a good show. So sorry, sometimes it's just much easier to say in Chinese. I also want to see if there's a like, Chinese audience, maybe some terminology will, 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 will uh, strike that exact chord. And then, uh, so I was mentioning how oolongs are typically made with a single cultivar. So Tiguanyin is also the name of the cultivar and then later became uh, the representative making style of the tea as well. So you can also make Tiguanyin style tea but with other cultivars uh, even though nowadays people just all adopt it called the Tiguanyin. So for 
uh, this Dantong or Phoenix Oolong, uh, this particular variety was actually very, very interesting. If you have had Dantong before, or Phoenix Oolong before, you immediately notice how small the leaves are. This is truly an oddball, but one of my favorite cultivar wise uh, for uh, Dantong because this is a typical trunk style. So it's like a tree, a trunk style, small leaf varietal. Uh, what I mean is, so usually if people uh, uh, usually associate trunk style tea trees with warmer climates or more in the south, the leaves are much larger. But this is a tea tree and the leaves are like this big. It's like baby leaves. It's called Ju Duo Zai. Uh, some of you more experienced you probably have guessed. Um, the name really translates to a, uh, a serrated gate uh, edge uh, little like Zai is like a, when, uh, a nickname for like a little kid. Um, so it's very like a fuzzy looking tea leaf and it's just like, uh, I don't know if you guys saw this meme on the internet, it's like this deck, it says fear me, fear the fuzziness. And every time I see the tea tree, I think of that little, very cute picture. It's just like a very fuzzy, small leaf varietal. Uh, it's also very distinctive, uh, like different from all the other dense home. Uh, usually dense home people associate with extreme floralness or extremely uh, uh, fruitiness. Uh, this is, uh, the flavor is actually classified as an herbal note. It also has another name called Xin Ren Xiang, which means uh, the fragrance of African kernel. And because African kernel is uh, very commonly mistranslated as almond, this has to do with when Chinese people first see a giant almond, they thought it was just a giant African kernel. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, uh, so it's a so if you want to know what African kernel tastes like, it's like an intense almond. So uh, so it has a distinctive herbal kind of note to it. Um, it has a weight to it. So it has even though it's very small, it actually has a very weighty body, and that's what I really like about the tea. Um, it's it is tannic, but yet it's buttery at the same time. cup to the front. So I want you to immediately notice the difference in the color. So see, this is an orangey color. Um, color is due to both oxidation and also the roasting. And once again, we don't drink the first brew. We're gonna give it to the tea pet. Uh, actually, this style of brewing is invented for this particular style of tea. Um, and I mentioned earlier that uh, Dantong is actually a misnomer because Dantong is actually referring to a very specific grade of the Phoenix Oolong back in the days of communal farming. Uh, you basically had to pick teas only from very large and very old tea trees. You pick the tea individually and you process each individual tea uh, tree individually and then you blend it all. Uh, so this blending is what makes it a dense home. We actually do have a single tree uh, Phoenix Oolong at Tea Drunk, but it was not blended. It was just the whole batch comes from this one tree. Um, nowadays, you virtually don't have dance home anymore, but dance home was what made Phoenix Oolong the most popular. So, um, so people just start calling all teas dance home, which is not really a, a correct terminology. Alright, so now let's try this tea. Mm. So, uh, also like here's a here's just correlation, you know, uh, from my years of experience in the in the tea world, and I I think most tea makers will agree with me too. If you use a small leaf varietal to make oolong, it's always very aromatic, and the large leaf usually makes the tea uh, softer in the in the water. But this particular one, you immediately notice there's like a weighty feeling to it. And it has like a, this, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit like a, a, a mossy, peaty kind of note to it. it but it's not, it's not smoky. Uh, so it's like, it's, it's literally like a, like a, 
um, uh, when when the um, uh, the the tea leaves have not completely not the tea leaves when when the the the, the falling leaves haven't completely turned into uh, dirt yet, uh, so it's not earthy, but it has a very special aroma to it, and that's what Judozai has. Sometimes people would also say it's a little bit uh, almost metallic kind of feeling to it. Uh, a little bit like that too. So it's a bit of like a mossy and, and you know, stainless steel has a smell. So it's a little bit like that as well. Oh, and I was mentioning how um, this style of brewing, the Gong Fu style of brewing was actually uh, started out for this particular tea. And I mentioned during our pour session, uh, this Gaiwan in Chinese, we do not really uh, call it the 110 milliliter Gaiwan, we call it the seven gram Gaiwan because seven grams is the uh, standard brewing size you put in for this style of Wulong. Um, by the way, the region also has a very interesting uh, practice where no matter how many guests they have, they always put three cups together like this. And that's also the name of the teacup. You know, the name of this teacup are called uh, three sip cups. But it's very difficult to drink it in exactly three sips, especially if you're super conscious about it. Um, now, uh, the reason it's called three sip cups is because the Chinese words are hieroglyphic. So if you um, have a, uh, a square, like just you know, four size. Uh, that's actual word in Chinese means mouth. And we'll put three of these together in a period sh shape like this. That's the word uh, for taste. So, uh, that's why it's called the three sip cup. And then in the region, people actually have this tradition of foregoing the fairness cup, but they would, uh, no matter how many guests they have, they will always pour the tea into these three cups. So they're just like doing circles and stuff. Um, and this is also why rinsing your cup become very important because sometimes that's the only cleaning you get. Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to ruin your tea appetite, but some households have them very clean and sometimes when I go drink the tea, they offer you the tea and then you put it uh, to your mouth and it's very slippery and you're like, oh shit. <laughs> uh, but it's, 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 it's all good. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next one I'm so excited to share. Um, so this one is a Wi Yan Cha, or um, uh, translates to cliff tea, rock tea. Uh, you get the, the, the essence of it. So the reason it's translated to that is because, uh, or the reason it's you know, called Yan Cha in Chinese is because the region is very cliffy. Um, it's actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site very pretty even if it's not for tea i would highly recommend that you uh go visit um uh if you've ever visit china it's a it's a it's just a beautiful area and uh right now because of the tea because of the tourism because all the other uh, awesome development in the region it also attracts so many artists and very talented people there as well so the humanity uh, side of it is also uh very much worth a visit now uh, Weishan right now, I would say it's the most mature tea region of China. Um, partly due to uh, its UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, status and partly due to uh, the popularity with tourism, but also, um, ah, sorry, got disconnected again. So, but also uh, just because how well uh, the tea is developed there. Now, uh, I would say an uh, experience going to Uishan would be very similar to an experience that you have going through uh, a wine region. Um, it's uh, also very well accommodated, so that's also why you need to visit. Now, um, for, as for any very mature tea region, you, uh, uh, the location, so the Tawar is very well defined. You can consider it's almost like the Chinese uh, version of the AOC. Uh, like for wine. So uh, this one I have here comes from a very, very, very good location. Um, so in Wishan in general, you can classify the Tawar into uh, the True Cliff region, the Half Cliff region, which is surrounding the True Cliff region, and the High Mountain region. So the Half Cliff and the High Mountain region um, 
are regarded similarly and then demand similar prices. However, uh, the, the styles are very different. The high mountain ones is softer, sweeter, and the half cliff will make you more of that minerality that you're looking for in the cliff tea, but it's just on a weaker level. And then the majority of the oolong out there, the yan cha out there, of course, are plantation teas. They come from just the surrounding area, the surrounding cities and townships. So so, so just know that. And it's, it's just very common for all Chinese teas. Now, if we bring our attention back to just the True Cliff, so the whole UNESCO World Heritage Site is the True Cliff region. Uh, there's an ongoing joke in Wishan uh, to say if you had to pay a ticket to go in, uh, you're in the True Cliff region. If you did not get a ticket to go in, you're not in the True Cliff region. But the True Cliff region was actually developed over time. And right now we're at this, uh, the fourth generation of the True Cliff. So it depends on which generation the True Cliff uh, kind of received its uh, 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 pedigree. It's also a whole di very, very different weight. So at the very, very top of all the Toar in the first generation, um, but it's not just these uh, uh, five locations though, is the Toar we call San Keng Liang Jian, which is the three dips and uh, the two creeks. Like that's the translation. If you see some similar translation, that's it. Um, and so the three of them is the uh, um, uh, Niu Lan Keng, Hui Yuan Keng, Dao Shui Keng. Yeah, so that's the three dips. And then uh, the other two top to are uh, is the Liu Xiang Jian, Wu Yuan Jian. Now, this is one come from Hui Yuan Keng. So, Hui Yuan Keng is one of my favorite writers. Hui Yuan Keng is mostly known for uh, their very, very, very old Shui Xian tea trees. Uh, they just call it the Bai Nian Lao Song, the uh, 100 year tea trees. Now, Hu Yangheng, the Tawar gives the uh, really old tea tree a particularly unique uh, sheep milk note. Um, so within the True Cliff region, the varietal is dominantly Rogui and Shui Xian. And they're often compared side by side because they represent two very different styles. Um, you have Rogui that's um, uh, very sharp, very upward. I always say Rogui is like this. It's very aromatic as well. It also has sometimes have a little bit bitter and it's like the spicy note this varietal has. Shui Xian is the opposite. Shui Xian is soft and broad and it goes downward. Now, uh, so people usually have very strong preference of Rogui and Shui Xian. Uh, of course, Rogui demands a little bit higher price unless if it's a very, very old tree, Shui Xian. Um, but Rogui usually has the younger trees, not super young because the region doesn't really have any, the True Cliff region is not supposed to have any tea tree that's like under 8 years old. So uh, this is a Rogui, but this Rogui has a sheep milk note. So the reason I'm so excited about this tea is uh, I'm often asked by people, what is your favorite tea? And it is indeed a very difficult uh, 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 question to answer because the short story is always I love all teas, which is true, right? Um, and of course, you know, your preference for tea can sometimes uh, change depends on the day, the mood is very much like food, you know, you don't want to eat the same thing every day. However, um, the teas that I truly like, and this is mostly because I have been in this for so long, you know, and uh, I make tea and, and all that, um, is a tea that I there's breakthrough, and so it takes a lot to explain why I like a certain tea because you have to know what are the limitations of certain tea and what the tea has made a breakthrough and that's why you love it so much. This is one of my all-time favorites. This Rogue is not even, so Rogue is not even my favorite uh, cultivar because I think it's sharper. I mean, but this is just, you know, a, a preference. There's so many people love Rogue instead of Tracia. I love Tracia more than Rogue However, because uh, usually I feel it's a little bit aggressive, it's very sharp, but uh, this is the uh, uh, Rogue that's so gooey and it's so soft. Uh, and also, for a Rogue like I mentioned earlier, it, it usually does not represent the Tawar as uh, vividly as a Shui Xian because Shui Xian has older uh, tea trees. But this one has that sheep milk note. It's so amazing. It has done everything that a rogue is not supposed to do, but it has done it. So this is a Hui Yuan Keng Rogue. Um, and as you know, uh, you want to cut it like a, like a <laughs> pro. 
Um, this is really just more for snobbish purposes, right? Um, it's like if you hold a wine bottle a certain way, people feel like they know what you're doing. Uh, so same thing, if you have a bag, so most of the uh, oolongs in China are pre-packaged into the standard room size, and then for cup tea, it's uh, 8.3 grams. So uh, you want to cut it like this. You can uh, cut it off so you don't have uh, to worry about leaving space. If you don't cut it off, obviously you now have uh, one piece of trash instead of two. And then what you want to do, uh, it just helps to channel the tea out a little bit better. So it has a little bit of a benefit, but it's mostly to show that you're uh, cool or whatever. All right. Oh, I need to make sure. So because this tea table is actually much larger than what you can see, um, but I want to bring you closer. So I keep forgetting and then putting the, uh, teaware into a section where you actually cannot see on camera. And they always make sure you use boiling water. Boiling water is a must-have for oolong. So um, there are certain teas that you must not use boiling water, and then certain teas you must use boiling water. And then um, in between you have teas that uh, is whatever, is more forgiving. Especially for very good tea. Remember we are talking about how for really good tea, you always want to use hotter water. I can already smell the sheep milk. It's amazing. You always want to use hotter water to bring out the complexity. But for more inferior tea, you use less water or you can increase the water to tea ratio to dilute the flaws. Oh my god. It's really amazing. And also, I, I absolutely love this tea maker's roasting style. It's a, it's a roasting style uh, that, that is just so, um, so mellow but full. Oh, oh, by the way, if you had to ever explain to people, uh, just a long story short, what makes a, um, uh, you know, what is a yan cha, you can say it's a, uh, a, mediumly roast, a mediumly fermented oolong, but heavily roasted. Yeah. You can see the color of the tea. I'll step aside, you can see the color. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> obviously you're not supposed to drink the first brew, but I'm gonna drink the first brew anyway. Now the reason we don't drink the first brew is not because the first brew is unpleasant, it's not because we're with, uh, washing the tea, um, and it's not because we want to get rid of the caffeine, um, it's just because we want to wake up the tea. And the first brew, the tea, especially for oolong, most of them are tightly roasted, so the flavor hasn't started to come out yet. And then um, with the first, uh, first brew, it's mostly just the aroma of the tea and the true taste of the tea hasn't settled in yet. And this is very obvious if you uh, just compare side by side. And the water is so tender, so soft. You know, you always want to... Sometimes when the water comes into your mouth, you feel like it's a little bit more tangible. And this one is just like, if, if water has texture, right? It's softer. It's like... Uh, it's it's more like a marshmallow, so it's not airy. It's not like the you know the uh, Milan floors where it's elegant as airy goes sideways. It's just softer. You can still feel the coherence of the whole thing. It doesn't expand, but yet it's it's just it lands like ooh, it's like it touches you very soft. Yeah. And then for cliff tea, uh, there are a few mantras. So the mantra for cliff tea is what we call floral nose and uh, the rock bone. So uh, now floral nose, I think we kind of all can uh, get what it is. Now, what is the rock bone? Um, the rock bone um, can be uh, explained in many different ways, right? Um, but in general, it's has like a, uh, a high level of minerality in its nose, especially in its aftertaste. Um, and the better the cliff tea, after you brew it over and over, and when you completely exhausted the tea, uh, you smell the tea, it actually smells almost like wet rock. Uh, and when you drink it, it feels like there's like this, uh, uh, like a mineral water, so it feels like it carries the, uh, the, the, 
the the disintegrated rock or it's like a liquefied stone that goes through your mouth sometimes it even provides a little bit like a cooling sensation because of that oh uh and then here's the um uh the last point I want to kind of just oh maybe I should also give you the the hierarchy and this hierarchy is very similar to the taste hierarchy as well um, and so remember we're talking about the aroma the taste the texture and then the aftertaste this is like a hierarchy of taste aroma is the easiest to achieve it's good but it's not impressive and then you want to go for the for the actual taste and then the texture and then the aftertaste so for cup tea we actually also have uh, this uh, uh, kind of conventional wisdom to go about it, and it's the four words huo gan qing xiang. So uh, xiang, uh, the aroma is also the last, right? And then how clean the tea tastes, kind of clean, clear, transparent the tea tastes. That's the uh, the qing, uh, uh, sorry, the huo gan qing, yeah, qing, and then the gan, because it goes the other way in Chinese. Uh, and then gan is, uh, remember the word that's different from the direct sweetness, it's a different kind of sweetness. It's like um, if the the sweetness that we're usually talking about is is more substantial and this is a sweetness that's more abstract yeah uh, so it's that kind of sweetness and then you have huo, like how lively it is it's very very difficult remember I was talking about how for lighter color tea looking for the lightest color and put your bet on that for darker color tea it is very very difficult to make the tea taste lively it's almost even as it goes downward it has this up Cool to it and uh, it's almost like the water just like dances on your on your on your palate and then when you drink it the water hits your tongue it's like wow it's like it's like it slaps it like but very gently and that's how we want it for a very very good uh, cup of tea and this one is very very cool also um, uh, sometimes people ask like what is the the right roasting style for uh, a oolong so it's not the traditional roasting is uh, first of all traditional oolong are all roasted that's for sure uh, and they, they're usually roasted twice but it's not about uh, how uh, it's not about um, if you want it a high roast or you want it a low roast it's about in Chinese we actually call it zhong zhu huo, which means enough roast yeah so you basically uh, the best practice in tea making and roasting is always you have to look at the tea to make the tea so you have to first understand what kind of roasting does this particular batch of tea demand and then you give it that so you want to make sure this whole tea leaves is saturated with the roast and that's it yeah so if you go over it it becomes the high roast so it's all relative the high roast is like how much you have gone over the enough roast and then the light roast light roast is how much you are missing from the um the the enough roast yeah um all right so that's that's all i have to say now let's uh, see if uh, you have questions. I'm actually gonna have to walk around and then bring the, ca uh, the, the camera closer to me. All right, hi. So uh, let me see that I see one question. If it's going to be available to Brazil. Oh, so uh, the first question was uh, somebody asked about the Tiguanyin that we tasted uh, earlier. So, no, it's not a traditional Tiguanyin. So, it is a new style Tiguanyin. And a new style Tiguanyin, you can have it roasted or unroasted. So, it's an unroasted. And within unroasted, you have five different styles. This is the style Zheng Chao. That, uh, that was the Tiguanyin that we tasted. And then. Uh, so the other question is if it's going to be available to Brazil. So for overseas, um, the thing is, given the current circumstance, we just cannot guarantee you receive everything on time. Um, but we do have the ability to ship uh, internationally. And um, we're trying to figure out how we can uh, record at least the tasting portion. And then we're going to host uh, uh, multiple brewing uh, workshops because a brewing workshop is, uh, is a little bit more intimate. I want to be able to see all the participants so I can make adjustments for your brewing style and things like that. It will we'll also try to limit the number of people on there. But for the tasting, it's going to be more of like a broadcasting. Uh, 
Do you want the rose to complement but not overpower the tea? Um, the roasty this is part of the tea so yes you do not want to overpower the tea sometimes uh uh when i taste certain tea it's just a roasty level and then it's that uh and also depends on how you roasted the tea you know sometimes the tea actually is burnt outside but uh it's not uh uh like even done inside so it's almost like you know when you grill uh things you burned outside you charred outside but the inside is not done yet um so those are just very very poor uh roasting it's basically misfired and then uh the tea will taste very roasty but yet a lack of substance so there's no tea taste it's just the taste of the fire um yeah so that you do not want it in chinese uh we actually say you know in tea making that if you uh, don't know how to roast the tea, you can't roast the tea empty. So you can actually, by roasting the tea, you are slowly making the tea emptier and emptier in this taste. Oh, what's the best variety of fruits you can make? Oh, okay, so, uh, hi Diana, we miss you too. And I, I mean, I miss everybody because like now it's just an empty tea house. Um, uh, so Jinju Mei is this uh, style of red tea that single-handedly made uh, red tea, uh, like revived red tea in the domestic market in China. If you don't know, uh, red tea is basically black tea in the West, but in China there's a long history of exporting the tea, but Chinese people don't really drink it uh, on a large, like a widespread population. So, uh, but Jinju Mei was this uh, single butt red tea that was invented at an area near Wuxian. It's technically still part of Wuxian in the high mountain area um, so the tradition there's no such thing as traditional in Jinjumei in a way but the traditional varietal of the region is Xiaozhong so uh, it's the heirloom varietal and that's what people would use to uh, make the world famous Jingshan Xiaozhong or Lapsan Suchong uh, as well however uh, you can also use other single varietals to make Jinjumei and I know a very, very popular one is Meizhan uh, and Meijia is like a great variety. It's one of my favorite varietals. Uh, it's a very large leaf. It's gooey. It's it's just it's so soft and it's a uh, uh, it's very very elegant. So uh, I've had Meijia made into red tea, into uh, cliff tea. So uh, it's a very good varietal. Yeah. So it's a, it's very popular as well. Uh, there's also certain. Um, uh, cross breeze, like people would use uh, things like uh, jin dan and stuff like that to make uh, uh, jinju mei as well. But the 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 other one would be the uh, the uh, the the heirloom xiaozhong. That's the most standard one. You have top five, like my personal favorite. Uh, well, my favorite is. Uh, <laughs> I really like Tielohan, yeah. Uh, Tielohan is this varietal that for the body, it really rivals uh, Shui Xian, which is one of the stable varietal. Um, it's woodsy, it's downward, it's, it's just, it's more uh, aroma neutral, and you get to focus a lot on its body, and then when it's done really, really well, it's creamy, um, it's just, it, it gives you a very specific kind of uh, satisfaction. Uh, I mentioned Meijian earlier. I really love Meijian as well. Um, uh, what else do I like? The, mm, I mean, I like Shui Xian. Mm, in general, I don't like a, a varietal that's very uh, over the top aromatic. So, uh, so, so that's the, the, my personal preference though. Uh, yeah, uh, there's actually the other day people asked about the dream of red chamber, what tea people drink. Remember I was saying that uh, there's a varietal, called, there's like the tea that they drink in the novels called Lao Jun Mei, and later there's so many Lao Jun Mei in China, but of course we don't know, you know which one is the real one and stuff like that. So in Wuxian there's actually a varietal called Lao Jun Mei, it tastes like mung bean soup, I really like that one too. Uh, Oh, so, uh, well, the Meijian is really, <laughs> it really depends on how well people make that year as well. So keep in mind, the majority of the teas in the Wuxian area is either Rogui and Shuixian for the True Cliff region. It gets much more um, uh, colorful once you get out of True Cliff region. So in Half Cliff and in High Mountain area, people make so much more. The... Uh, so Meijian really depends on, uh, so, 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 so any single varietal is already so much more rare and it really has to do with how well people actually make it.
Yeah. How do we uh, 铁罗汉 Oh yeah, T I E uh, L U O H A N. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Now I'm just reading it. Uh, Oh, Shui Jingui. Yeah, Shui Jingui. I have to say, Shui Jingui is uh, is very very uh, popular varietal. And actually, when we had uh, Shui Jingui at Tea House, it's probably uh, the favorite among our regulars. I really love Shui Jingui as well. Shui Jingui, is especially a good Shui Jingui, is so hard to come by. Shui Jingui is a very volatile varietal. Is that's what we call the tea maker's tea? Like you know, tea maker makes master Shui Jingui. They're so proud. Um, so so different tea depends on the. Uh, so basically, you have a different window to capture the the best performance of the tea, and you have to seize it in that moment. There are certain teas that are more volatile and more difficult to make. Shui Jingui is one of them. If you don't make it very well, it's kind of, um, how do I say, it's like a, it can, it can be uh, like almost like a rotten vegetable and fruit kind of note to it. But if you make it really well, it has a fruity layer of note to uh, the tea, and it also has really big body, and the aroma is, 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 is bright, but yet it's very soft, so it's a very amazing tea as well. Uh, Qilan, yeah, actually at the tea house we have really amazing Qilan. So Qilan is a very, very aromatic varietal. Now, uh, so, 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 you know, people either love it or, or dislike it, but it's a very popular varietal because it's so aromatic. And uh, we actually have True Cliff uh, Qilan. It comes from the, the, the fourth generation of the Cliff region, but um, Qilan, the hardest thing about these, what we call small varietals, is that it's very, very difficult to bring out the body because body and aroma sometimes are at odd with each other. So uh, when you, uh, but, But but when you have a uh, Qilan with body, it's really amazing. There's also a Huang Guan Yin uh, that we currently have. I highly highly recommend that one too. That's also one of my favorite. Even though Huang Guan Yin is not my favorite varietal, but it is the most, uh, <laughs> it's the least annoying Huang Guan Yin I've ever had. Oh, Huang Mei Gui, yeah, it's just yeah, Huang Mei Gui is also like very aromatic and stuff. Can you say the four qualities? Oh, uh, so the fruit quality is huo gan qing xiang. So huo is how lively uh, or um, uh, I guess you get the idea how lively it is, the vitality of it. So that's the top, top tier. And then gan is the more of the abstract sweetness. Um, and then the uh, qing is basically how clear, how clean, Uh, uh, how 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 like trans uh, tranquil I guess the tea is, and then xiang is the aroma. So aroma is is important, but it's it's the uh, easiest to achieve. So that's why it's the lowest in the hierarchy. Yeah. Oh, but in terms of the 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 the, the more universal application of the, the the taste hierarchy, yes, you basically have aroma, and then you have the taste. And the very first step to train your palate is to be able to distinguish aroma and and taste. Um, and then taste and then body, so the texture. And then uh, that this is like you know you want tannins, but you do not want to uh, coarse tannins. You want to fine tannins. Uh, you want a lot of the fine tannins. You want a very little of the coarse tannins. So there's always for any factor, there's always the quantity and the quality. And then it's the aftertaste. Yeah. Ooh, awesome. Yeah, that china is very very aromatic, and it's very. Uh, Like you, you can't forget a Qilan, yeah. Oh, let me see. There are more questions now. Do you want the rose to come? Oh, yeah, okay, there is. Oh, oh wait. Oh, aged oolong. Uh, so we already talked a little bit about aged tea, you know, in Pu'er, how China never had a tradition of aging tea. Um, and then, uh, so, so you technically don't have a like a purposely aged poor even before 2003 so I'll be very very careful if people oversell you on the age of the tea because also remember since 2003 to now China's economics has gone through uh, uh, 
up so much and then the cost of labor and everything so every year actually the fresh leaves are more expensive than the year before so uh, it's always the age of the tea tree matters more than the age of the tea itself and then for oolong oolong actually does not even have a basis for aging because the tea has gone through a uh, kill green step um, so which means it does not really have any enzymes to pres uh, preserve its complexity uh, during this aging process um, and it's just becoming one dimensional just really becoming earthier and earthier and it also getting away um taking away one thing that we very value very much for oolong which is the uh the aroma level and uh yeah so uh, usually if you get sold uh, age oolong is really just a level over oolong i have to be honest <laughs> Uh, however, you know, uh, oolong we do want to drink it the second and third year. Uh, that's usually when the uh, the the aroma and everything uh, solidify a little bit more. So that's actually the more golden age to drink oolong. And then usually within five years, it's if you keep it really well, it's it's all very good. Yeah. Oh, how to roast tea at home? So um, they're like. In China, there are online uh, places that sells the the electronic uh, roaster, but you, but one is I don't know how they will ship to the states, and also uh, sometimes because the electric one they they basically um, waven uh, the the tray with bamboo. It's very important, it's bamboo, but it's just uh, the burner instead of a a, a charcoal. Uh, ball uh, uh, being as the the heat source they replace it with this uh, uh, coil that you can heat it up now uh, so sometimes the the bamboo is not waving very well it's also not good so if you have a chance to go to China I would unless you have a very very good online source I actually have bought a, a, a roaster online before for a friend in China but they don't ship internationally the ones I saw internationally from the picture they don't look very well but I haven't watched like like, look recently so I don't know who started selling uh, internationally and who doesn't it's much better if you are able to like go take a look to see how how fine the the waving uh, the is yeah the breeding basically um, no not all green tea but so no tea is supposed to be better now uh, however in with that said green tea is the most forgivable if it is bitter because um, green tea in a way uh, preserves most of the tea's original taste, which is a bitter green. But for all teas, we're always looking for uh, more drinkable features. So bitterness is not something we seek. Yes, so... Uh, yeah, so Da Hong Pao is a blend. <laughs> yeah, it's very important. Uh, but by the way, for everything I talk about, for Oolong and everything, you can actually find uh, them in written form on our website under Learn and Tea Fundamentals. Um, it's, it's just a lot of information. It's all written. And uh, I wouldn't say it's the most reader-friendly uh, format, but it's a lot of information. So if you care about spelling and things like that, you can definitely go on there uh, to take a look. Now, uh, for Da Hong Pao, there's so many myths and everything about it. Uh, there's actually a YouTube video of me interviewing uh, the head monk of the temple where the Da Hong Pao tea trees are in. The Da Hong Pao trees are literally in their backyard. So he'll uh, provide you know, his, uh, his perspective on it, which is the, um, the pretty mainstream uh, information, I would say. And then, uh, then the main, most main takeaway is that no, that it is a blend. It is not some crazy tea trees. Uh, it's actually one of the three categories uh, in uh, stable categories in um, for Wu Yan Cha. For any tea competition, usually it's Rou Gui Shui Xian, uh, Da Hong Pao, these three. And in the most prestige uh, competition every year in Wu Yishan that happens in mid-November, uh, they, uh, depends on the year, they sometimes have a other category, sometimes they don't have the other category. Um, and then the Da Hong Pao, whether or not it's, 
the same uh, blend every year. Obviously, the material, everything is different, so vintage matters a lot. Um, for our Da Hong Pao, the Da Hong Pao 2018 and Da Hong Pao 2019, without any number and everything on it, is the same formula but different years. Um, the Da Hong Pao 2 that we have, because um, I see Richard, you're asking, that's why I'm going into the detail. Uh, so the Da Hong Pao 2 we have is a different style of blend. Uh, that we, we want to look for. It's a little bit softer, so the, uh, the Da Hong Pao 1, or it actually doesn't have a number on it, is more uh, on the aroma, it's a lavish. It's a lavish feeling is what we want. It's a more showy Da Hong Pao. The Da Hong Pao 2 is a little bit softer. Well, we wanted the, 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 the tea, and actually, which is called the water, we want the, the liqueur to feel cleaner, softer, and sweeter. Um, and then, of course, we have the Da Hong Pao every day, which uses raw material from a more um, affordable source. And then we want to make it more accessible to everyday drinking. A lot of green tea from different heat houses are better. Yes, so when you want to blend tea, so for example, Da Hong Pao is a blended tea. Uh, in China, actually, in Chinese, we actually have two different terminologies for blending with intent, so you blend to make a tea, or you just like like randomly blend teas together. Uh, it's a uh, pinpei or da dui, yeah. So most of the the blend that, that, that sometimes I see is really just people randomly putting teas together. So that's not blending. Blending is, uh, you know, started the tea, you know, with, with, the, with the ends in mind. So, um, so for example, for cleft tea, you always have to basically roast the tea to a certain level. Uh, because different varietals, they can remember take on different levels of roastiness. So you have to uh, keep in mind what you're going to uh, use as your ingredients, and then you um, blend, you 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 uh, roast them into different levels, and then you then blend them, and then do the last one or two rounds of roasting together with the tea. So then they all finish at the same level. If that makes sense, yeah. So, so it's a very and there are certain rules and certain things that go don't go into a blend, and it, mostly because the varietal has too strong a character. So, for example, um, Xilan, uh, given it's a very aromatic varietal, people actually don't like to use it uh, for blend because you know poor blending is when you can taste what ingredients is in there, and then you know a a, a proud tea maker will, will feel very ashamed if you can tell exactly what went into the blend so so china is so identifiable it's a very dangerous ingredient to use any more questions okay all right thank you so much everyone um if you have more questions you can always you know me we're going to, uh, well, so for example, if you have a tea, you know, that you, uh, let's say it's this roasty level, and another tea is this roasty level, and another tea is that roasty level, so you, you have three ingredients, if you blend them, roasted them together, you're going to always, uh, you cannot have one method for all, right? You're going to have um, uh, one of the teas that's, uh, roasted just right, another tea over fire, another tea under fire. So what you need to do is you have to pre-roast the tea to prepare them and then the last roasting kind of bring them all to the same level. If, I hope that, that makes it more clear. It's very much like cooking, yeah. All right. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Uh, send us more questions on Instagram if you if you want. Yeah. All right. Bye. Thank you.